I have the impossible task of introducing these spectacular, beautiful, multifaceted women. And I'm going to try and keep it brief because I'm a little conscious about the time that we just have a very, very short, short time available to us. I know you want to hear them. So very quickly, she's a counterculture giant, part of a lineage of poets from Walt Whitman to Allen Ginsberg, writer, editor, teacher, performer, curator, practicing Buddhist and activist. I'm sorry if I've left any of your labels out. Uh, the remarkable Anne Waldman has a body of work, including over 40 books of poetry and poetics, including her thousand-page feminist epic, the Iovis trilogy, and her most recent work, Voices, Daughter of a Heart Yet to be Born. Yasmin Abdul Majid's Twitter handle describes her in two words, does things. This <laughs> barely begins to explain the things she does or identifies with because she's a mechanical engineer, a social advocate, a writer, and gosh, I must be getting old. She's a petrol head. Whatever that means, I haven't a clue. <laughs> she identifies herself as a Muslim woman who is born in Sudan and raised in Australia, where she founded Youth Without Borders at the ripe old age of 16. And her coming-of-age memoir, Yasmin's Story, was written at 24. She has trained as a boxer and loves motorsport, football, and adventure. And her day job is on an oil rig. <laughs> TV and radio presenter and journalist Anita Anand is the author of two books, the most recent co-authored with William Dalrymple on the Kohinoor Diamond, the world's most infamous stone. Her earlier book is the story of someone who is considerably less, less well-known, Sophia, the, an Indian princess and granddaughter of the last Sikh Maharaja of Lahore. And we will be talking about Sophia and why you chose to write about her in a, in a bit. Uh, professor and chair of the Environmental Studies Department here in Boulder at Naropa University, Janine Canty's work covers issues of social and ecological justice. Very, very relevant uh, uh, as we sit here today. Amongst the courses she teaches are courses in eco-psychology, deep ecology and ecological justice, patterns of oppression and healing. She has most recently edited an anthology of essays featuring a wide spectrum of women's voices called Ecological and Social Healing, Multicultural Women's Voices. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I landed in New York from New Delhi to the shocking and horrific news of the murder of my former colleague, Gauri Lankesh, the journalist who was gunned down in front of her house while she was returning home from work. I worked with Gauri in Sunday Magazine many, many years ago. She was a fierce, fearless, and very vocal critic of right-wing politics and the sort of nationalism that is on the rise in my country these days. And I'm ashamed to say that her murder has been celebrated very openly and very vocally by a section of these right-wing uh, Hindu nationalists. Uh, we do know that women in my country and everywhere in the world continue to live under the threat of violence. We are seeing the very worrying mainstreaming of hate and bigotry in Charlottesville most recently, where we saw racist, anti-Semitic white nationalists marching without stigma or shame. And so because we stand here at this precipice of our collective history, I requested Anne to begin with, a, with an in invocation to this spirit of women, to solidarity and peace. Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and such an honor to be with you all, and thank you. Okay, I'll just do a little bit from a section called Matriot Acts came about, of course, with the Patriot Act. Uh, so I'm still collecting all the Matriot Acts. And uh, it's a section from the long Eovis trilogy, the feminist work. Invoke the, invoke the hyena in petticoats, laughing hyena, spotted hyena, stripped, all stalk the charnel ground amidst microscopic and telescopic worlds, a step ahead of what is to come, of what is to come in lineage, in gratitude, in naming, in naming, in naming las madres, in naming, in naming the demands of our bodies, 
look for reclamation, sniff it out in a voice not my own, but all of them, the wizened, ductile face of slumbering female memory. Beginning of time, the timepiece of time, she who was the mother of a ghost ship, ship of locked awe and subjugated dreams, she who could never be reduced to a gender issue, she who announced a talismanic bond to planet who saw vole tracks in the snow once on a radical poet's tiny death plot, touch us, touch us with crenellated beauty now, may plead particles in the sunlight, a democratic grace who documented all hurts and slights and transmuted them to poetry, to flesh. She was a challenge in my heart, the penultimate mother Denial silences violence. Remember the suffragettes. Oh, mothers of the shaking tent ceremony. Mothers of bifurcated space. Mother of what goes on in your head. Mothers of restless night. Start up and dream to new poetry. Shock the animalized spirit. Splice into the virtual movie. Be kind, crone, in old mobility. Subject, be kind and keep moving, keep moving. Object, planet of kindness towards sweet redress. Protect the children. That is your genetic command. Man, object, more resistance, metabolism, mothers of dilation and expansion, mothers with field guides, mothers with centripetal force, mothers rumpled, mothers of the matrix, mothers with weapons hidden in their hair, a bayonet and a tattoo in the shape of a skull at arms. This was what we were up against as young girls stood up for their dream in the way of life. The fair sex will retaliate, the dark sex will retaliate a fair break, justice in love. What takes it to break a stupor? What takes it a new me metabolic modus? What takes it an antithetical hallucination? New narrations, tensions, take back, stoned for adultery. All actions reversed in masculine time, horoscopes read and remarked upon. What is it in my stars? What planets rule mythical anti-fascist space and be a mutable form, a shapeshifter? Be that little girl with her tiny instruments who investigates the female cosmos. Be next to her as she works overtime in the scriptorian, brewing her witchy stew. Call matriarchy, matriarchy is called. Matriarch, matriarch, matriarch. Thank you. And you're, you're brilliant always. Uh, stay with me because I'm going to put my first question to you as well. Uh, we live in a time of very obvious hypermasculine leadership, political leadership, from Trump to Putin to Modi to Erdogan. And yet, it's impossible to ignore the resistance. You know, the marches that we saw uh, in, in my own country, we see, we see women uh, coming together, fighting, uh, taking, going to the courts, fighting for, for their rights. How do you see this moment in history? Do you see this as hope, despair? It's exhilarating. I think we have to resist. I think it's going on all over the world. I think it's very complex and unusually, an unusually challenging time because sometimes you feel so uh, much under siege and you feel the cognitive dissonance of our world and you know one thing and you know you've known it for many years and you're in touch with many people who know it you share an ethos and yet you don't have the power you know to really change the frequency right away and so I've been trying because I travel mainly as a poet and an educator a performer and you know I think to the places I've been that I want to I, that I stay in touch with so I worked in Kerala uh, a few years ago for the State Department, I was went visited Muslim colleges and met women there who have, you know, consider themselves feminists, but within a certain context and cultural context. And so their question to me were things like, you know, how do you feel about the hijab? And, and uh, you know, they were referencing the situation in France with Sarkozy and the banning of the headscarf. And, you know, I just said, you all look so beautiful, you should be able to, you know, wear this. And then I have friends, you know, sophisticated poet friends in France who were agreeing with the position. And I kept saying it's a red herring. It's because it's not, not attending to other issues about how, you know, people of difference are, are treated. And so the complexities there, I think, um, you know, and I'm in touch with, I worked in a, an orphanage in, uh, outside, in Marrakesh and working with uh, young women who would, you know, had they not been rescued in some cases would probably be servants and pros even prostitutes and so on. So these kinds of projects where, you know, you're starting um, with younger people who are trying to find uh, their, their, 
their identity and their, their relationship to how to live in this you know, very complex world with all the roiling and we're all connected now so we know what other people do and their mores and so on and yet we, they're used by the, uh, the ruling classes for d divisiveness and to keep people down. I mean, it's very, very complex. Um, I guess your question is, yeah, we have, a, a, it's a very, very hard time. It's hard for people in my generation who feel like they've worked, you know, many, many years with all the issues were there with, you know, Stonewall and things like that. I mean, we also have to include, you know, people of, of uh, the, the whole bi and gay and queer communities and the transgender communities. And we have to be thinking as, you know, in the, in the last talks we've been hearing up here, the, you know, issues around uh, nuclear, war around climate change, uh, it's just, it's so vast. So you, you almost have to pick your battles, but the, yes, uh, the enemy is there and we have to rise, we have to stay sane, we have to take care of ourselves, we have to be in communication. I try to stay in touch with you know, students who are in other parts of the world, a uh, recent friend in, in India also working in um, an area where, where you know, same-sex marriage is an issue. Uh, for women and so on. So, you and know, trying men. to keep in, in touch. So I'll, I'll, right. I'll pass it on. So, a woman in a headscarf, a red herring, I think that's the perfect opening for you because, <laughs> yes, because men, clearly you a agree. woman who wears yeah. a headscarf can only talk about that. Thank no, but, but I, I think, I think what, what Anne was saying was just how it's complex. And I think you've talked about this in your TEDx talk, just the complexity of identity and, and this whole business, you know, as women of color, I mean, how do we get involved in this global conversation? How do we own this global conversation? I'm sorry, I was being facetious. I think it's, it's fascinating. I mean, even the term feminism is one that a lot of Muslim women don't... Um, and don't engage with or don't align themselves with at all because the the term and the concept was used in the same um, package that colonization came in, the same package that sort of Western influence came in. And, and like there were um, politicians that came into countries like Egypt from the West and said, we are here to bring feminism, to liberate you, right? And when someone who looks like me says, that my faith to me is feminist, people are outraged. How dare you say such a thing? Don't you know what happens in Saudi Arabia? Don't you know what happens in Sudan? I'm like, yeah, mate, I know. Don't you know what happens in Australia? Don't, like, show me a place where we have gender equality, 100%. Show me this utopia. Because I, I'd love to go there, right? It does not exist. And so what I find fascinating is we cannot talk about these, and when you, you talk about complexity, we cannot talk about these issues in isolation. Mm -hmm. We cannot talk about gender equality in isolation to racial equality, to sexual equality, to all of these other ways that marginalization intersects, right? I know my faith is used as a tool by all sides of any spectrum to keep me as a woman who is a person of color in a place, right? And that place is usually not at the top. And I think the common theme, you know, if we're talking about fem like feminism, whatever term you want to use, the common theme is patriarchy. We all live in very patriarchal societies, whether we want to call them that or not. And some have different degrees of patriarchy. Some have different abilities to face up to their patriarchy, but rest assured, the systems that operate are deeply patriarchal. And generally, those in power, men, will use whatever tools are at their hands, whether it is religion, whether it is capitalism, whether it is whatever tool they can find and they can, whether it's nationalism, to keep women or those who identify as women as subjugated. Let us not, like, let us not pretend this is not happening. This happens in the home. Violence against women is prolific in Australia, in a country that deems itself very gender equal. One in three women face some sort of abuse in the home. More than a woman dies a week at the hands of their partner. Right, and people want to tell me about Saudi Arabia? 
we find it very easy to point to those that are other and say your religion is the problem. The way that you dress is the problem. And when I say to someone, I believe that I am free in the way that I choose to be free, they do not want to hear it. Because we seem sometimes unable to accept there is more than one type of truth. What is right for me is not right for you, and that is okay. So when we talk about across cultures, it comes back for me to this idea of accepting difference as equal, not necessarily requiring everything to look the same, and fighting for somebody else's right on their own terms, and accepting what their truth is as their truth and not having to argue. But I mean, that's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> Absolutely. I should tell you that in my country, very recently, we won a major uh, legal battle fought by Muslim feminists. And uh, these were women who went to the Supreme Court because in India, you're allowed to follow your personal laws. So the Islamic personal law permitted, permits a man to arbitrarily divorce his wife by saying talaq three times. And they went to court and they went to the Supreme Court and they said, this is nonsense. This, this goes against our human rights. This goes against the constitution and they won. So, so, so Muslim feminists, you know, I mean, we, I think we need to just get, maybe move away from these labels. Um, uh, Anita, I want to ask you as a storyteller, you know, you picked the story of a relatively less known suffragette. Now, in your own country, in England, where you live, uh, don't ask me where I picked this fact up, 158 of the 925 public statues are of women, including allegorical and mythical women, you know, all the Greek goddesses and so on and so forth. You know the whole controversy of getting Jane Austen on a postage stamp. So what is the importance and role of biography? Why do we need to hear the stories of women? Because these are some kick-ass women. <laughs> and because we need to know about kick-ass women. Any culture that suppresses kick-ass women will seek to delete those stories, to hide them from you, to hide the template from your daughters and from your sons. You know, I'm fine with the phrase, uh, the word feminist. Mm -hmm. I am a very proud feminist. Mm -hmm. I am proud of the women who call themselves feminists and I am so proud of the men who call themselves feminists. Because if you're not a feminist, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> really. So this, this uh, statues conversation is very interesting. I've got some good news for you, in fact. I can tell you right now. Um, I've been part of a campaign uh, led by a wonderful woman, the same kick-ass woman, by the way, who got Jane Austen on the £10 note. You can now get those out of cash machines in London. Um, it will probably be worth about three peanuts in Brexit Britain, but, you know, <laughs> Jane Austen is on that note. Uh, but we have just won a victory to get a woman uh, erected in Parliament Square. Um, and it is Fawcett, the mother of the suffragette movement in Great Britain. You know, we have Emmeline Pankhurst hidden away around the corner, around the back of Westminster. Now we will have Fawcett right front and centre in Westminster. This is a huge, huge victory. And there is another campaign to get Mary Wollstonecroft uh, in statue form as well. I think we're going to win that one too. So why do I write stories about women like Sophia? There are, let me first of all tell you, there are much easier ways to earn a living. Mm -hmm. Writing is really, really hard. Um, uh, somebody asked me, uh, you know, what is it like to write? And I think um, a friend of mine said, writing a book is like reading a book, except the book is trying to kill you. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's start with that. Writing about, writing about somebody nobody's heard of, they're trying to kill you really slowly and painfully. <laughs> Writing about a woman of colour that nobody has heard of. I mean, you, you know, hung, drawn and quartered is kind of like a summer holiday. But why was it important to do it? Because uh, Sophia Dalip Singh, first of all, just to give you a little background, those of you who, who won't know who she is, um, was an extraordinary, extraordinary young woman. She was the daughter of the last Maharaja of, of Punjab, as you say, but she was, she was like me. She was an immigrant, born and brought up in Britain. Brown skin, and like me, uh, where I grew up, I, you know, I was one of the few women of color in the place where I grew up. She was also the goddaughter of Queen Victoria, just so happened. 
Queens. She lived at Hampton Court Palace. She was this paparazzi princess. She had the best life ever. She was Kardashian-esque. I mean, she was really actually quite a chore of a woman for most of her life until she hit 30. And then she went on this, uh, this trip to India, which the British authorities had completely banned her from making this trip because her they thought, having deposed her father in this most appalling way, that if she went back or if anybody of their surname, the Dilip Singhs, went back, they might spark some kind of revolution. But these daughters of the Maharaja, the sons never bothered to try and take on the establishment. The daughters, however, said, no, we're going. And they did. They sneaked into India. And what she saw in India, and I think that's really interesting what Anne was saying before, you know, some of these, these battles that we fight today run on parallel lines. So what she saw in India, the very worst of colonialism, she saw everything that had been taken away from her father. She saw everything that had been taken away from the people who were struggling under the weight of a famine, and yet she'd have been invited to this enormous three-day party thro thrown by the Viceroy to celebrate the might of the empire. And she came back thinking, this is not enough. I need to do something. And she heard the voice of the, the people fighting the colonialists. You know, they were shouting in India. Uh, those of you who speak Hindi will know, avazdo, 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 which means give us a voice, give us a voice. And she washes up again back in her home in Britain where, you know, everybody welcomes her. The, you know, the, 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 the cameras are waiting to click her. They want to welcome her back into the fashion pages. And she suddenly hears this refrain again, give us a voice, give us a voice. And it's coming from the suffragettes. And this is why the sisterhood and why the word feminism is not our enemy, it is our friend. Because even though she knew the color of the skin of the people who had taken everything from her family and everything from her people, the people she now recognized as her people, she dedicated the rest of her life to fighting for white women's votes. The start of that movement has led to each and every one of us with ovaries in this room having the vote right now. And when I say about fighting, we're talking about somebody who had, when you have nothing, it's very easy to fight because you have no choice. When you have everything and you just jeopardize the whole lot of it to fight because it is right, that is what makes this particular woman and the women I am fascinated with, even in Kohinoor, which is a very masculine book, I've really fought to bring the women out because women's stories are, are all too easily lost. And this particular woman's story, the state tried to erase her because, you know, the last thing the British wanted, they, are, they, are, they have a, their hands on a colony that is, is bubbling away and is restive. They're about to send the young men of India to fight in a war in the First World War and dump them in some of the worst fighting on the Western Front. And the last thing they need is to have this Indian princess defying the state, throwing herself at the, the, the car of the prime minister, fighting with policemen outside Westminster. And so slowly but surely, they chipped and chipped and chipped and deleted her until she was gone. The only reason I even know about her, bizarrely, is because a little picture appeared in a magazine when I was on maternity leave. I was flicking through it, and I saw a picture uh, it, all it said was suffragettes selling newspaper outside Hampton Court. And I, you guys, I guess, you know, it was a sepia picture. You've heard, of, uh, you've heard of Gaydar. We from Punjab have Punjar, right? So from Google Earth, you can detect another Punjabi, right? You just have that. If you're Punjabi, you know what I'm saying. And there was something about this woman that made me think, this woman is brown. Not only is she brown, she's Punjabi. How is this possible? I'm a political journalist of 20 years standing, a feminist, and I don't know about an Indian suffragette. Mm -hmm. And that became the four-year obsession which made me write a book, and I hate writing books. It's so hard. But I am very, very proud that I put her back. Thank you. Jeanine, there has never been a better time to discuss climate change than now in the wake of Hurricane Harvey and Irma and the devastation that we are witnessing. And according to some accounts, we have 300 million climate change refugees in the world uh, right now. Uh, you once said, I believe, that the oppression of people and the oppression of Earth come from the same patterns. What did you mean by this? Thank you for asking that. 
Um, I feel like it's such an important question and something that we all need to be centered upon. Um, really, if you, again, the oppression of people and the oppression of Earth go hand in hand. And I'm very um, US-centric in my lens because this is where I'm from. And so I often look at large-scale patterns of racism. And you can really look at any large-scale uh, pattern of racism, and it's always about um, the acquisition of natural resources. And so often when we're teaching you know, diversity or multicultural education courses, we have this mythology that there's good and bad people, and if somehow um, people just let go of their racism, then we would all be free. And um, in the US, often that means free to um, pursue the American dream, which then would be taking the resources of other people in the global south and all around the world, which is happening right now. And so if we actually don't look at the intersectionality between these issues, and particularly in looking um, through environmental justice lenses that um, recognize that people of color, indigenous peoples, um, poor people, um, women, children, and the working class are disproportionately affected by ecological issues. Um, and often these issues that um, marginalized peoples are fighting are framed as human rights issues rather than ecological issues. But when you're talking about these three million, I uh, saw a statistic um, years ago that it's uh, 200,000 people per day are displaced from their homelands, um, from their local communities because of corporate globalization. And so we're often seeing you know, refugee issues, all of this as um, human rights issues rather than looking at um, corporations coming into people's homelands again and again and displacing people. And um, part of that, um, you know, and kind of the um, um, heartbreaking brilliancy of it is it forces then all of these people then to become um, consumers and workers rather than to be able to live off of their land. And so um, for me, so much of this and um, ecofeminism and eco-psychology and social justice are um, at the heart of kind of the, the whirlwind for me. Um, if we're actually not connecting back to Earth, and I love the metaphor as Earth as mother, and that makes me such a feminist because um, our mother is in the deepest peril right now, and any person living under the um, perils of corporate globalization, and in eco-psychology we say Western culture, but really now it's anyone who's living under the um, corporate globalization, which is almost everyone on this planet, um, that we're actually living under collective madness. Um, we see so much suffering, we see so many addictions, consumerisms, and it's just unbridled. And if we actually, I think so much of the sisterhood that we're talking about is about the larger feminine, and it's not only feminine of um, women, but it's about this um, being collective. Um, most indigenous peoples are indigenous peoples because it's not about individuals, it's about collectives. Women, I think, more easily work in collectives. The earth works in collectives. And so I think the oppression and the healing happens when we um, pair those together. Thank you. Um, So collectivization. Uh, Yasmin, my next question is going to be to you as a new generation leader. How do we collectivize? How do we begin to connect the dots amongst previously segregated and disparate issues? What are the tools that you would use to mobilize? I'm so cautious whenever, whenever I'm described as a leader. Because, um, I mean, that comes with massive responsibility, right? I think, I mean, it's interesting because I often compare and contrast my upbringing. So I was born in Sudan. My family is this kind of mongrel mix of Sudanese, Egyptian, Turkish, and Moroccan, but very kind of um, Middle East, North Africa region, Ottoman Empire, really. Um, and then my upbringing in Australia, which is very kind of British-centric, American-influenced, individualistic kind of Western. And so what I had at home was my parents 
sort of saying, your purpose in this world, and my faith teaching, your purpose in this world is to serve. You're right. You are part of a collective constantly. You are actually not important. What is important is what you do for others. Versus the messages that then I was taught outside, which was, you are, num you are number one. You have to look after yourself. Right? What is important is progressing you. And, and I think, I do wonder how they sit side by side. I do wonder whether, um, or pulling, all right, let me just go on a bit of a sidebar. I think maybe the way that I now try to talk about it is to remind people, and I said this earlier today, that none of us exist in a vacuum, right? None of us exist in any vacuum, whether it's historical, whether it's economic, whether it's social, we are all parts of and operating within systems, whether we like it or not. And if we think that our, in our decisions, our choices, even if we are choosing not to make any active choices, that in of itself is a choice, mm -hmm. right? Because it means that we will let our decisions be kind of run by whatever the status quo is. And so, the first thing I think in terms of collectivizing or galvanizing people into thinking of ourselves as a collective is to remind people that none of us can operate solely as individuals. That even at the very basic sense, who we are is an essence of the collective of the people around us. Our parents, our schools, our opportunities that happen, like where we grew up, all of these things deeply influence, not even just influence, there's amazing science at the moment that talks about it's not nature versus nurture, it's the fact that the first five years of your life become your nature, right? The way that neuroscience works is that you are still who you are, who your nature actually is, is being defined by how you're nurtured in those early few years. So we're never simply individuals. So firstly, realizing that, and then secondly, having conversations around how can we be more active about the choices we're making? How can we create alternative parallel systems so that we don't necessarily have to operate within the, the systems that clearly are not working for everyone? I mean, I wish I had all the answers. Every once in a while, I'm like, just revolution. But you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll see. What do you reckon? Eh? Right. Anita, as a woman of color who lives in England, and I should actually emphasize a post-Brexit uh, England, how do you confront the stereotypes, particularly in a world that is increasingly suspicious and hostile to immigrants? Do you believe, I believe it was Suketu Mehta who recently wrote in Foreign Policy, he says the phobia of migrants can be the greatest threat to democracy. Well, it is a, it is a, a sad truth that um, the, the number of racist attacks, every time you have that kind of rhetoric, the fear of the other, we have to close our borders, you know, th those things go up. You see it, you don't even have to look as far as my country. Look at this country. Yeah. Look at the numbers in your papers um, uh, of hate crimes, uh, of actual crimes, of violence. You can feel it. You can feel the, the prickle in the air, you know, you can, you can sense it carried on the wind. So what do you do about that? I mean, this is more of a this is more, this is an this is an everyone question. This is, and I think what you have to do is you have to speak up, and you have to speak louder than they do, and you have to put your arms around the vulnerable. I mean, you know, one of the things you said you don't like sort of calling yourself a leader. I think you should. I think you really yeah. just just do it. Just just you know wear I, I it. I think it's women fine. need to own that you have term. To own we it, just right? need to own it. You do. Yeah. Don't be. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's right. a real. No, 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 no. It's a real. It's a real. It's a. It's a. It's also. It's a feminine thing to sort of say. I don't want. I don't want to wear it because I somehow. Don't oh, like I'm definitely willing to take up mantles. Take it, okay? Totally. Like yeah, it. take it. Because and I because I think that we can learn a lot from women who have done that in the past. So, to use the the, the people that I've kind of been been looking at when I wrote Sophia in particular. These were times which were not dissimilar. These were where, the, you know, the, it, it okay, wasn't people for the color of their skin. They were invisible. You know, at that time, they just didn't really exist in any meaningful way in Britain. But, but if you like, women as a whole, poor women, were the equivalent. You know, they were, they were deprived of their rights. They were treated appallingly by the police, who were absolutely given the green light to use sexual violence or any kind of violence to put them down. They were vilified for asking for anything. Second class citizens. So use that as a template for what you're talking about. You had women who stood up and said, no, nah, 
not happening. You had women from that group who were, who were there's a fabulous woman called Emmeline Sproson in, 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 in the book, who was poor working class. She was a chambermaid. She had to go out and work from the age of nine. She was sexually assaulted by the brother of her mistress and, and, and drummed out of service to the point where she had to leave her home, her mother, her, her everything, because she was the one who carried the scandal even though he had tried to rape her. And she goes to another city, a whole totally different part of the world. This, this, this almost like, a, she was an immigrant, okay? She didn't belong there. She goes to another city. And she gets involved through the church in Sunday school where they do what I think we all have to do to change things. This is what changes things. They gave her a voice. They allowed her to speak. They allowed her to hear the sound of her own voice doing sermons or speaking or preaching or whatever. And she got used to hearing it. And so when this dreadful man called Lord Curzon, is doing the rounds. He's also a very arch, ardent colonialist, and he, he has set up a charming organization called the Anti-Suffrage League, which says that women really can't vote because they've got uh, ovaries which, which make them hysterical, mm -hmm. and so they can't be expected to make decisions. He also says that if you give women the vote, we'll lose the colonies, because if, if those people see us under the whip hand of women, they won't listen to us anymore. I mean, he's an absolute charmer of a man. Uh, Miss Sproson, my he hero, she stands up and she puts her hand up to ask him a question. And he won't take the question. And he takes questions from the men, but he won't take it from her. And she puts up her hand even more. And there are some trade unionists around men who say, Emma's got a question. Listen to her question. And he won't take her question. And through the frustration of that, she learns to shout. So the lesson in your template example is, Learn to shout, and also learn to make space for those voices that need to be heard. Right. Because that's what changes stuff. I'm using Absolutely. the term woman up. Yeah. I say it to men, I say it to children, I say it to all the sisters out you there, know, woman up. And Lord Curzon wasn't that far off the mark because we're still hearing about how women are not, we don't have the brains to do science and we don't, you, there is science that could prove that we cannot do science and yeah. uh, uh, Yasmin is, is, is here as living uh, <laughs> proof of that. Um, I think we have, we're, we're running, how much time do we have? I mean, Whoa, 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 okay, Janine. Um, can I just okay. add one thing really yes, quickly please. onto that? Also, it is not um, the job of the oppressed to only speak on these issues, right? And so, like, in addition to that, for, you know, if you are able-bodied, talk to other able-bodied people about issues of disability. If you are white, talk to other white people about race issues. If you are men, talk to your mates, your bloke mates, your guy mates about feminism, right? Because sometimes they will hear it from you in ways they won't hear it from someone who looks like me. And do not, like, do not underestimate the importance of speaking in your own communities about these issues as well, because it cannot happen in isolation. Absolutely. I, I don't see us as a minority any longer. I mean, we're 50% of the population. Well, in my country, we're 40, well, in my country, we're 48.5, because they, they, they kill fetuses if they're female. Uh, and so, but we are 48.5% or 50 or 51%, and so we're not a minority. We need, we, you know, we are a big group, and I think we need to realize our strengths. And, and um, so, Janine, my question to you really is that what is your vision of a new leadership? What is the kind of leadership that we as women have to own? That's a big question. I know. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing really brings this concept of edge awareness. And again, it's um, centered on um, ecological issues and social justice issues. And as we're, as uh, my sisters have talked about, we're so situated within um, systems of patriarchy and capitalism, which are kind of hand in hand. Um, it's actually women and um, you know, the quote unquote marginalized that have the least investment in these systems because they um, benefit the least, that actually have the um, lens. I um, often think about it as a broken lens uh, because that lens doesn't fit the mainstream. And so the solutions are not going to come from those who are 
wedded within the, these systems that are benefiting from it. And so I think when you're talking about making space for other voices, so much of it is letting um, multicultural women that are breaking through these pathways and have different angles and views to step up. And voice is so much a part of it. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to give the last word to Anne before I open this uh, to the audience. As a poet, Anne, who has all her life, you, all your life, you've believed in collaborative work. Uh, what is your recipe? I, I want your wisdom on taking this forward. Yes, well, collaboration. Or taking, but when, yeah. this, when I say this, I mean taking this global movement for women forward. I think it's important to be in touch with other communities and those of us fortunate to travel and write and, and uh, read, of course, but to really initiate those kinds of discourses and conversations and to work with, uh, I'm working with women artists and working with visual artists in collaboration, working with Meredith Monk, the performer, and we do a, a show together, uh, which is very empowering, I think, for, for other women performers and word workers. Um, I'm very impressed by the Rojava women, and that's a very another challenging. Uh, and I was going to read a statement from a group in the, the in North America, sort of supporting. They're the women in in Kurdistan. Maybe some of you know of who've taken up arms uh, against uh, ISIS and are fighting as you know warriors. As a Buddhist, I have difficulty with uh, war and weaponry and so on. I you know these questions are coming up now. How do you actually uh, change the, the um, you know, the, that's a huge situation, of course. But they're, they're, a lot of their um, statements uh, talk about uh, equalization of the rights and so on. They're making great st strides within their own community, which is secular, but also respects uh, different traditions. It's a, you know, very, a real trouble spot in the world. So I think to be aware of things like that, of you can get information online about, the, and there's a very interesting book edited actually by people I know and people who've traveled there and so on and some of their manifestos, I call them feminifestos, mm -hmm. and there's ways to just start working with the language. I don't use manifesto anymore when I, poets have to write manifestos of course all the time, just feminifesto and woman up mm -hmm. and uh, also a sense of the diversity of the, the feminine in, in everyone, possibly. And, and there's the word tathagatagarbha in Sanskrit, which is womb-like womb, womb -like wisdom. Mm -hmm. There's the sense of um, you know, feminine principle has to do with, and that's beyond gender, feminine principle has to do with environment, creating environment and nourishment and so on. So keep, you know, finding these ways through poetry, through uh, certain kind of spiritual traditions through many, many cultural traditions that have you know, deep, deep, ancient uh, wisdom for us. But we have to seek it out. And, and um, again, the, all the suggestions here about uh, communicating with one another all the time. So Absolutely. I'm very grateful for this. Never occasion. been a better time uh, than to be able to do this. And uh, I agree with you uh, as, as a journalist who works almost exclusively on gender. I find that my work uh, embraces so many communities. It embraces ch uh, children's rights. I mean, that's, that's my job. Uh, minority rights, sexual minority rights, uh, Dalit rights. Um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's uh, disabled, differently abled. I mean, that's all part of my work. Uh, and, and it's just, it's rich and, and uh, you know, the, the, the cliche, human right, you know, female, feminine rights. Uh, women's rights are human rights. It's never been truer than, uh, than now. Um, any questions? I, my request is to please introduce yourself and tell me who, you're, who this question is addressed to. Yes, please. So I'm an engineer and I work for a U.S. semiconductor company, has about 2,000 employees, mainly uh, uh, engineers. And unlike 30 years ago, about 25% of the engineers are now women. The company is also, those engineers are about two-thirds immigrants. And of the women, of those 25% of women, I would say maybe 90% are immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, there's almost no, say, white American women engineers, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of Chinese and Indian mm -hmm. 
women engineers. And so I'm, I find it odd that from the culture where kind of, uh, I guess you could say bourgeois feminism, that is to say lean forward, you can become equal in the workplace and so forth, where this is much more known in, um, in the US and Europe, especially in the US, mm -hmm. Uh, it seems to be almost completely irrelevant in terms of the actual progress of women, which is mainly, in my, my experience, Indian and Chinese and a smattering of Europeans and Iranians and so forth. I have some statistics for you, if I could um, yes. answer that before I give it to Yasmin, which is that if you look at Indian engineering colleges, if you look at engineering colleges as a whole, about 35% of the students are, in fact, women. So becoming an engineer or becoming a doctor is very aspirational, and most parents want their daughters, I mean, the ones who are studying, to become. It's only when you go into the elite institutions, what we call our IITs, which is equivalent to your MIT, that the percentage of women students falls to about seven, eight, nine percent. And that's because they're very expensive. You need to go to coaching classes. Parents don't want to spend that kind of money on daughters. Coaching classes are held late in the evening. It's not safe for them. Public transport is not safe. But becoming, I mean, women in STEM is not an alien concept in India, and I presume in China, though I don't, I, I can't speak for China. Yes, I know, but, but so that's what I'm saying. Just, you know, when we, when we have these stereotypes and these silos, I mean, what is, you know, in, in India, a woman in an engineering college or in, in, a me, in medical school, the 40% students are women. Uh, it's again the elite schools, the, the, the All India Institute of Medical Science, which is like the, the best medical school, where they drop to a single percentage. So as a, as a woman who is an engineer, um, this is like really interesting. Um, and I've talked to a, a whole bunch of different people about this. So firstly, right, the issue of women in STEM is not just women getting into university, right? And, and people who sort of um, research this will tell you it goes way back to, you know, what parents give, like what kind of gifts they give their kids. Do they give their kids logos or Barbie dolls? And what the idea of maths and science, how it's gendered in a particular culture. In most, I'm going to broadly say, um, you know, collectivists, whether it's India, China, most North African countries, maths and science are not seen as feminine um, or not seen as masculine, sorry, subjects, yeah. Yeah. right? We don't have the, the same kind of gendered split around maths and science. It's more kind of split around security and safety and prestige, right? Things like maths and science are given prestige. So if you are smart, or if, if you want anything for your kids, whether they are a, a, a male or a female daughter, um, child, you want them to go into those sort of subjects. So firstly, I guess the immigrant question um, is that parents will encourage their daughters into maths and science subjects from the very beginning because they're seen as prestigious. That's the first thing. The second thing, and it's this really, it, it works kind of counterintuitively, is that when you say, in, I can talk to the Australian context, when you come in, you look at an engineering class, right? You've got, in, when I did engineering, there were, um, in mechanical, there were seven girls and 300 guys. But when we started, there was about 34% women. But what you have is the majority of the white, the majority of the men were white, right? And they had the same, they came from the same, quote unquote, cultural background as the white women. And so, because in the sort of white Australian context, maths and science weren't seen as feminine, they could use that cultural kind of cringe to squeeze them out and say, well, you're, what you're doing isn't feminine. But because they weren't from the same culture as an immigrant, their cultural expectation didn't impact me, mm -hmm. right? It, I didn't really care what the white boys thought, right? <laughs> and so what you find is that actually for women of color, for immigrant women, the expectation that comes from the white men in that world doesn't impact them. The expectation from the men of color, yeah. Yeah. massively influential. Massively, which is why the questions around marriage, the question, all those, there are a whole bunch of different questions. But those men didn't have the same issues with doing maths and science. Does that kind of? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anita, you wanted to oh, add? Mine, mine really, I mean, this is the very serious point. Mine is, mine is an anecdote, a true uh, story. A friend of mine who did um, engineering, actually at Imperial College in London, so I can't speak to the American example. Um, but she was one, I think it was a cohort of 230 uh, people on that course, and she was one of four women on that course. 
about 15 years ago. And as she said to me, she said, um, Anita, you know, uh, the odds were good, but the goods were odd. <laughs> so it's true. <laughs> so, I, I told you I wasn't going to shed much light, but I, I love that so much. I just thought I'd share it to you. Yeah. We engineers are a particular type of people. Right. Did we have... I, do we want... I was going to actually give the mic that side because I just wanted to give that side a chance, if you don't mind. We're at Courage. Hi, my name is Nicole. And I was in India 20 years ago as a college student. And my first impression was that the women were so impressive and intelligent and amazing with the NGOs. And I was just in awe. Um, and then there's a time in Jaipur where all of a sudden I was Eve teased. A friend of mine were on the streets just by ourselves, and all of a sudden, like, 13, like, young boys were just coming up and, like, smacking us. And we're like, this is really weird. But we said to them in Hindi, like, I think I can still say it. Uh, yes, mata ji oh, good one. Where's your mother? Yo, where's your mother? <laughs> <laughs> and they all stopped because there's this duality of mother and goddess and that type of thing. And then I just, you know, keep thinking, you know, and there's more technology and internet and press of the Eve teasing going on and, you know, the fight of, and it's an environmental justice of, you know, globalization and the deliberalization of the economy and, like, the issue of women going to the bathroom at night because they don't have bathrooms and they're getting sexually assaulted. And I guess it's not really a question, but it's just... No, that is, that is the awful reality. And in fact, I've been writing uh, extensively about not using the word Eve teasing because it's this cute little uh, word that trivializes what is really street sexual harassment. And we have, we have a new law, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it takes time and, and sexual assault is a reality. Uh, does anyone no, want uh, to? No, completely. Just let's not call it Eve teasing ever. Yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> sexual assault. That's exactly what yeah. it is. But you know, the, the tidal wave, I don't know, you, you know that terrible, brutal rape of that um, young student in Delhi? Yes. Did you see how many women yeah. took to the streets and scared the shit out of politicians? Mm. Uh, you see it all over the world. You know, when women take to their feet yep. in their masses, it it really shakes things Women up. and men, I yeah. should say. Lots of men. And then they did, yeah. absolutely. With the, the feminist men who I'm, yeah. you know, speak of, speak very highly of. Some of my favorite people. Sorry? I feel like the Indian men aren't that scared of being called feminist once they join. I don't think anyone should be scared of right, being called I think, a I don't know, I think we, should, we should be men. done with that debate. Well, of We're course they should be, but yeah. not, maybe it's another thing of just okay. not my culture versus. You know, okay. But it's, it's, it's nice to see the men joining and not yes. being like, well, it was great. That. It was yeah. great. Any more questions? Right there. I'll come to you. Hi, uh, my name is Liana. Um, this question, I don't really know who to pose it to, but um, I was thinking about uh, when you said collective madness, I thought about mental um, uh, health, which is kind of different but related, and uh, the conversation about grief and anger and also depression and anxiety. I'd like someone who wants to talk about those topics. I'd love to hear about it. I, I recently attended a panel where they talked about sexism as a mental health issue. And they talked about how, in so many ways, simply being a woman is traumatic, right? Because you go, you can go through life having to constantly navigate traumatic experiences, whether that is sexual assault, whether that is um, sexism in the workplace, whether that is um, domestic violence in the home. And we find that time and time and time again, I sit, if I sit with any group of women and we decide to start talking about, you know, real life things, you find that the majority of the people around the table my age would have had some sort of sexual assault experience, would have had a relationship that was abusive. And it's, it's this extra burden, right, of simply existing and simply surviving in of itself can be traumatic. Um, and they call it minority stress, right? Or like, I guess, as women not being a minority, it's a marginalization stress. Mm -hmm. And the analogy is this. You get poked in the arm once, it's like, maybe funny. You get poked in the arm a couple of times, it's a little bit, you get poked in the arm for an hour, it's annoying. You get poked in the arm for a day, it's all you can think about. For a week, 
after a year, after a lifetime of being poked in the arm, it can drive you insane. The, it, the thing itself is simply just a poke in the arm. It's simply just a small, minor thing that in of itself, when you isolate it, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But over a lifetime, it can drive you crazy. And so I think sometimes when we think about being a woman um, in the world, sometimes we can, uh, we don't, I think, give the, the extra burden, the honor it deserves. But all microaggressions, I mean, oh, that, that just going on constantly. To, to everyone who is not part of the norm, yeah. yeah. I would, um, and I loved your question. I love the way you said your name. It was so singy. Um, I really think part of this um, dialogue when we're talking about interconnected systems and healing, and um, for me, it's so important to bring in compassion. I feel like we're collectively um, experiencing anxiety, depression, addictions, and um, there's a high rate um, especially in the U.S., with even you know white men experience this, and so um, as a woman, as a feminist, as um, uh, eco-feminist, I can't ignore that that's something a uh, collective thing, and part of the um, I think the work is actually um, recognizing that people that um, have privilege are actually often the least um, well-adjusted in, in that way, that they're actually experiencing a lot of depression, anxiety, that it's collective with everyone that's folded into these systems of oppression and globalized culture. Um, I feel um, heartbreak every day. I work with a lot of young people um, in the classroom and um, constantly hearing stories about you know, their friends with drugs or suicides attempts or um, just so many different forms of not being seen. Uh, and our culture, and particularly US culture, lets us get um, um, buried in that way. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that much more, but yeah, thanks for your question. You know, if you'd allow me, I'd like to share a story. I don't know how much time we have, and I'll try and keep the story brief because it was a story that really moved me as a journalist. And this is soon after the 2012 gang rape of this uh, medical student you talked about. I started making a documentary film on sexual violence in India. And in the course of making that film, I traveled to a village uh, where this girl, this young school girl who was 16 at the time, and uh, she had been raped, uh, gang raped, in a, in, a, in a car. She was going to school and she had to walk. There was a bit of a, sp a walk from her bus stop to her school and this car stopped uh, uh, and she was taken in and she was raped by these two men who then told her that we want you to come back in, in 15 days, you will meet us at such and such place or you know, we, we will, you know, they threatened her. She went back home, did not tell anyone about it and then about, uh, and obviously did not go back 15 days later, but a month later, her mother disappeared. And, uh, you know, it got, she mother went to buy medicine, didn't come back, and she started panicking, and then at night she went to the father. This is a Dalit girl, and if you know a little bit about India, Dalits are what, what used to be referred to as the untouchable, and the caste system is very, very prevalent in India, so they live separately. So when her father then, she told the father what had happened, she knew the men, they were from the same village, upper caste men, uh, the father went to the police station and said, this is what my daughter is telling me. And the police station said, you know, Dalit man, landless laborer, they kind of threw him out. And they said, you know, you need to, she needs to be missing for 24 hours before you come back to us. And the next morning, the mother's body was found. And then, of course, this became a, a big case. And when I met her at that time, and then these people, they were rich. You know, they lived in the village, but they were landowners and they were rich. And because the father was a landless laborer, he was working on their land. And they had taken away, he was a daily wage earner, and they had taken away all his work. So he was literally, you know, hand to mouth. And uh, I asked this girl, I said to her, I said, why don't you settle? They are offering you money. They are offering you land. Why don't you just settle and get on with your life? Just get on with it. 
And she told me something that made me so ashamed of myself and of my privilege. And she said, I cannot. She said, they took away my dignity. I have to fight for this. And this is a 16-year-old Dalit girl who had four younger brothers and sisters. The mother had died, which meant that she had to drop out of school and look after them because there was no one to cook and clean you know, and, and look after them. And um, I, I, I meet her, I still meet her once in a while. And the last time I met her, uh, I said, how's life, how's it coming along? And she says, I wish you'd come more often to meet me. And I said, why is that? So she says that, you know, when I go out, I am a victim. I have to live as a victim. And when I go out, if I, if I smile, my neighbors will say, look at this shameless girl. Her mother died because of her and she's smiling. And, and she still wouldn't settle. So this is courage. And I find that there is this generation, this, 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 this young, you know, they, they just will not settle. They just will not settle. And I think that is hope for the future. I'm sorry if I took time away from a That maybe was such a, last, a worthy story, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, we yeah. needed to hear that. Thank you so much. Um, and that is all the time that we have. Um, thank you all so much for joining us here today and hanging out with me at Skyscapes all day. Um, and this last session, totally my favorite. Are you all going to be around for a little while? Maybe, some, I know Ujwala wanted to ask a question. I'm so sorry, Ujwala, because I know that you asked a question in the last previous session. I said, let me give it to someone else. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Author signing um, does happen after the session. There's music following this. Um, but uh, yeah, please, let's have another round.